Hey, I hope you're having a good day. Elan here. Uh, very welcome back to the Holistic Health Podcast. And today I'm joined by Martina Quinn. Uh, Martina is the founder and CEO of Alice. She specializes in devising and delivering communications campaigns that create positive societal change. Over the course of her career, she has worked on campaigns to promote marriage equality, climate justice, integration and migrant rights, LGBTQ plus rights and more. She provided communication support to the coalition to repeal the Eighth Amendment and together for yes in the lead up to Ireland's successful abortion referendum in 2018. And she devised the award-winning Work Equal campaign, which promotes workplace gender equality. Martina has also worked on local, general and European elections since she was in her early teens. Uh, she currently chairs the board of the Public Relations Consultants Association of Ireland and represents Ireland on the board of ICCO, the International Communications Consultancy Organization. Uh, she's also a member of the board of Women's Aid and also we've been working together on her health, strength and fitness for the last seven months. Uh, Martina, how are you doing today? Great, thanks for having me, Elan. Oh, no, I've been really looking forward to this one because uh, you know, I think you're such an inspiration, you know, for a lot of people and definitely for me, you know, for everything that you're doing with your business and with Alice and, you know, it's, it's really, really cool to see. So yeah, I was really excited to have a quick chat today and, uh, you're involved in so many different things as well. <laughs> so you must be extremely busy. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I started working with you. <laughs> um, I didn't have I didn't have enough time in my schedule for um, good exercise habits. So I've been trying to change that over the past year. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, you've been doing really well with that. And like it must be very, you know, difficult to prioritize yourself and manage stress when you've got so much going on. Like, you know, that's a lot of different things to juggle all at the one time. Yeah, like I think when it comes to stress, I'm lucky because I am somebody who thrives in a sort of deadline driven environment. Um, so and I think you, you need to be like that if you're going to work in communications roles because it is very deadline driven. So um, even when I was in school, I used to be like that, like I'd sort of leave my homework to the last minute <laughs> and then be in a mad rush to get it done and stuff. But it that doesn't really stress me out. Um, so. I think, yeah, like I, I probably find myself getting less stressed about work things in general than about things in my personal life. You know? mm -hmm. Good stuff. And unfortunately, I was the type of student when I was younger. I was like, I left my homework to the last minute and then I was like, ah, I'll, I just won't, won't really do it. So <laughs> I got in trouble. <laughs> um, but I was really interested to find out, you know, like what inspired you to start Alice in the first place? And, you know, what was that process like? growing it essentially you know from the ground up yeah I started it without having a real plan to start a company so I think that made it less stressful as well because it happened very organically so basically I have been working um I worked in different communications roles I studied journalism in university I worked as a journalist for a couple of years and then I was working in in-house communications roles for a political party and for a charity and then I moved into agency PR and I was in the same agency for about eight years, um, a relatively small agency here in Dublin. And I had sort of gone as far as I could go within the structure there. So I decided to leave in June 2015. And I knew I didn't really want to go and work anywhere else. Um, so I thought I would do some freelance communications work and earn my living that way. And um, I was really lucky because it got busy very, very quickly. Um, People were brilliant, actually. It was really affirming at the start of, of um, setting up Alice because people sort of went out of their way to refer business to me or to introduce me to people who they thought might make a good client or whatever. So that was brilliant. Um, and within a couple of months, I had too much work to do by myself. So um, that's when the idea of starting a company was born, I guess. Um, and I had a couple of friends, um, former colleagues of mine who I was still very good friends with, who were working like sort of 
flexibly at the time you know they they had had children or they but like for personal reasons they weren't working full-time hours so they sort of had free time to give so they started working with me initially and that made it easy that I wasn't sort of hiring people as full-time employees from the start it was more giving people a few hours work here and there um and then in early 2016 I hired my first full-time employee and sort of accepted that I was becoming a proper company <laughs> and it's it's grown since then yeah that's amazing because like you know even just the ability to delegate different roles is so difficult you know when it's something that you've set up initially and like anyone who's ever tried to start a business or who runs a business or self-employed they know how difficult the process is even to go from zero to one but then to go from one to many is is a whole other kind of mindset Um, yeah I mean it's very different now because we have a team of nearly 25 people so um, we have a core staff of about, about 15 or 16 and then we have various consultants and um, freelancers who work with us you know according to when we need them or their areas of expertise so it's it's a much bigger team than I ever anticipated <laughs> having really and it does change your role a lot and um, it's something I have been challenged by over the past few years to sort of define what my role is in the company because I mean I love communications and I like working with clients and um running campaigns and doing all of that side of work and I didn't set out to be the person doing all the finance and the HR um and all of that which you inevitably become when you're the owner of the company so um we've expanded the operation support that we have a lot in the past two to three years um and i've worked with a really good accountant since the very early days of of alice and he serves as our cfo now so and is very heavily involved so that's good um and we've just hired an operations director this year which is brilliant because it takes a lot of those tasks away from me and means i can get back to doing the stuff that i prefer (laughs) yeah that's amazing yeah because it's like when you're starting your own business you're basically doing everything you're the cfo the ceo the cto you're you've got all the hats on and then yeah really something has to give because you've only got so much time in the day yeah and i was always really conscious as well that um like i think you need to play to your strengths because uh i know i'm good at communications and that's what i've chosen to do as my career but you know i did accountancy in school but i didn't want to become an accountant <laughs> like i'm not you know i'm not i'm I'm not bad at financial things, but I'm not excited by it. I don't want to spend weeks of my time like preparing our year-end accounts. I'd much prefer to invest in having a good accountant who you trust and knowing that they're doing the job properly and they're properly qualified to do it. And the same with HR, the same with any of those certain management tasks. Um, I've been much happier to invest in paying a third party to do them for me than to think, oh, I must do all of this myself. And then you're sort of wondering, are you even doing it right, you know? Yeah, no, that's a smart decision for sure. And like, you know, I'm really interested to to find out, you know, at what point did you get to where you're like, okay, like something in the communications arena is something that I'd love to do. You know, was there a specific point, you know, maybe when you're in college or something that you're like, okay, this is for me or what was that like for you? Um, I'm trying to remember back. It's so long ago now. Um, I like in school, my favorite subject was English and I loved history. Um, and I liked languages in general. Like I loved French and Irish. They were the two languages I was doing. Um, I was less keen on like maths and as I said, I was doing accountancy and stuff as well. Like wasn't as excited by them. So I always liked those sort of more humanities focused subjects and then I decided to study journalism and I did my degree in DCU and I realized during the degree I enjoyed the degree and actually I think it was a very good one because it's quite general it doesn't pigeonhole you into you know like it's quite a broad skill set so the people who were in my class at the time some of them are very well-known journalists now and others have gone on to work in completely different roles you know um but during the course I realized I didn't really want to be a sort of hard-nosed news journalist I didn't like the idea of um I can remember us doing these sort of simulated exercises where it was almost like somebody has just been killed and you have to turn up on their family's doorstep and ask them for a comment and I was like there's no way (laughs) to do that I would hate it um but I loved writing and I think my idea of journalism had been sparked by some of the like long-form features 
journalists who I really liked who wrote columns in the Sunday Times and stuff like that. It was very unrealistic at the age of 18 to think I'd walk out of college and get a job like that. So I still really liked communications. And um, I did work as a freelance journalist for a couple of years after college doing um, mostly sort of for specialised publications that, that focused on politics and local government. And we had to do a work placement as part of our degree. And I ended up doing my work placement in uh, Fine Gael headquarters in a communications role rather than something that was an obvious journalism fit. Um, and that probably shaped my career a lot then because I didn't go out and work in a newspaper for my work experience or in a magazine or whatever. I was working in comms, um, putting together different communications resources for election candidates and stuff like that. Um, and it sort of became a natural thing then that that was the type of work I did after that. And one of the things I've definitely learned about myself, and I think a lot of people who work in PR are similar, is that we don't like to be in front of the camera. Like We very much like to be behind it. And you're very happy advising clients and preparing them for media interviews and stuff, but you don't want to be featured yourself. And I think journalists, by and large, are very much in the public eye. So that side of it wouldn't really appeal to me. And especially like it's changed a huge amount even since I was in university, that's 20 years ago. So now anybody who's a working journalist, even if they're an old fashioned print journalist, they still are expected to have a social media presence and to be on radio and on television commentating on the news of the day and stuff. So you, like you're definitely a, a sort of public figure um, and I'm quite happy to not be. <laughs> Yeah, because being a journalist, obviously, like you're in a very powerful position, especially if you've got a lot of readers and you can influence a lot of people for good or for for worse, depends on. <laughs> yeah, know. yeah. And I think one of the things that didn't I didn't love about it, I suppose. And I mean, again, this is just how naive you are when you're only a teenager finishing school, you know, and you have a, a view of a job that isn't really true at all. Um, what I realized about journalism was that you had, you know, obviously as a working journalist, you'd be sent out to cover whatever story your editor decided you wanted to cover. Whereas I was, I'm sort of selfish about like, well, I'm only interested in this, you know, so I just want to focus on this. So that's the way my career has evolved as well, because, you know, I, I work with social justice clients and Alice, that's the type of work I'm interested in. I'm not interested in taking on like car brands or fashion brands or whatever it might be. Um, and you can be that focused in PR, whereas, and particularly if it's your own agency, um, whereas if you're a journalist working for a general news outlet, you can't be that focused. You go off and do what you're told to do. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's amazing. So it's it was kind of like when you started in the Fine Gael HQ, that was like your first kind of like dipping your foot in that specific type of communications yeah, I mean, I had grown up around it. My mother was involved in local politics all my life and her father had been involved in local politics before her. So we were a very um, politically aware family and um, both of my parents are like very into their current affairs and very involved in their local communities. So um, in a sort of... Um, by osmosis or something, I suppose I was picking those things up even as a child and as a teenager, you know, um, yeah. and yeah, helping out with election campaigns and stuff from the time we were able to walk free, <laughs> you know, so. Nice. So Martina for president soon enough? <laughs> no, <laughs> again, I prefer to be behind the scenes. Definitely wouldn't put myself forward for election or anything. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's so, uh, you know, interesting to find out where you start from because a, a lot of people, you know, they like when I was in college, I, it took me until like second year to kind of figure out like, oh, yeah, I, I lo really love working with people and like providing support and seeing them progress. So that's something that I know I'll, I'll enjoy doing. But, you know, it's so difficult to really figure out. And a lot of people it's don't. so hard. And I'm, I mean, I think well, this comes up a lot about the Irish education system. There's so much pressure placed on you when you're 17 or 18 to make a choice about your future career that <laughs> like you're really not capable of making at that time. Not. And I don't mean that because 17 or 18 year olds are too immature. It's more you just haven't had exposure to different types of work or even like a really broad range of subjects or whatever. So you don't know what you don't know, you know, and if you're choosing to study medicine or to, I don't know, become an accountant or whatever it might be, you don't really have any sense of what the the day to day life of those professions are, you know. So, yeah, I think um, I think that approach of like, you, you know, the way in the States when when young people go to college they get to do much more general subjects and then specialize after a few years I think that probably makes more sense for um you can take a couple of years to decide what your your strengths and your passions are and then make a more focused choice 
yeah for sure like i think there's there's so much pressure uh societal pressure in general to like get the most points and then to do the you know idea of course, the of that. yeah uh, so then everyone's trying to like you know get into medicine or something and like i know people who got into medicine and got all the points and did it for maybe like a few months or a year and then they dropped out because they're like this is not what i want to do but yeah that they were pressured to to get to that point and then they end up trying to figure out like what do I actually want to do you know yeah yeah I don't think the system works as it is yeah for sure so but um you know going back to Alice I was wondering you know like over so since 2015 it's been um nine years of coming up on a decade which is yeah like what have been some of the biggest challenges you faced you know, in, in, you know, growing to the point you're at now? Um, I think the early years were very good. Like I was really lucky because the people who started working with me in the first year of the business, um, most of them are still working with me now. So we had a really tight team um, and we got on really well. Like the, even the ones who have left, they're still good friends of mine. Um, so for probably the first two to three years, we had a team of about six or seven people and it was, um very streamlined and we all knew each other well and it was very easy to work with with each other and then the first big challenge that we faced was COVID um so no more than anybody <laughs> who was working at the time um it was uh you know completely out of the blue in terms of what you might predict as a challenge for your company and um because we work on a lot of events for our clients we were fairly pessimistic in the early days of COVID that it was going to have really serious consequences for the business. Um, and yeah, it was, I mean, that first month, I guess, of, of the, the very first lockdown in March 2020 or April 2020, it was pretty scary. You know what? You felt like you were at home twiddling your thumbs waiting for the phone to ring or something. Um, but uh, we had some things going for us. Like we were quite... Uh, streamlined team anyway and we had also always been really flexible in how we worked so well before from the very start we had been um very open to people working remotely and working part-time hours or working shorter weeks or whatever so the whole idea of moving everything online wasn't as intimidating to us um as it was to some longer established organizations i think you know and um like we were able to pick up our work online very smoothly and very easily um and then uh, luckily, because of the sort of clients we mostly work with, we actually ended up being busier during the few years of COVID um, than at any other time in the company's history. Because like lots of our clients are charities that provide supports to vulnerable communities and they were their services were really, really in demand during COVID. So we were working with clients to highlight the impact of like on people's mental health during COVID or on um, children's welfare or family support services, that type of thing. Um, and yeah, they ended up being very, very busy years. Not I like they were great in terms of growing the company and profitability and all of that. Um, they were really successful in that way, but they definitely took a toll in terms of employee morale and well-being. Um, and I did find all of the team were fairly burnt out by the time COVID lifted you know and people really craved company and um wanted to be around each other again and our team changed a good bit over that couple of years and the years since we've more than doubled in size we've hired a lot of new people obviously um and we haven't yet gotten back into and we probably never will get into a pre-COVID pattern where those people are working alongside each other day in day out and really get to know each other very well you know mm -hmm. um so there's been a lot of, of flux. And then in general, I suppose the, the staffing side of things is an ongoing challenge. Um, and again, we're lucky enough there because we're quite niche in what we do. And because we have that social justice focus, we tend to attract staff who want to work on the types of campaigns that we do. Um, and the odd time that we've hired somebody who doesn't really fit that profile, it hasn't been the right fit. And they've seen that, you know, they've moved on to another agency because they want to work in fashion PR, or they want to work more consumer clients or whatever. Um, so yeah, our team are brilliant, but I think it is always a juggle to just make sure 
you have enough people on the team that you're balancing like how busy you are with what you can afford in terms of hiring new staff um, and then getting new people settled in well and making sure that you have the right mix of skills and the right mix of personalities and that people have, you know, we still work remotely sort of two thirds of the time. Um, so making sure that people have opportunities to bond and sort of um, get on well and gel as a team as well. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Yeah, I think the hybrid model was was already starting to kind of come in before COVID anyway. Um, but obviously now uh, nearly everybody was forced into obviously going working from home completely. But it seems like now a lot of um, companies are like come in for two days and work at home from two or three days or more of like hybrid focused. Um, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. We're in the middle of moving to a new office this week, actually. <laughs> so um, our old one didn't have enough space for the size the team is now. So we finally all have the space um, and we're going to do one anchor day every Tuesday and then ask people to come in for one other day per week on average. Um, and after that, it's flexible. And some of our team want to be in for four or five days a week. They like it and, you know, it suits their circumstances and others don't particularly want to be. So um, yeah. we try to be as flexible as we can, really. Amazing. Well, congrats on moving to the new office. That must feel... Thank you. Well, it'll feel good when we're properly settled in there at the moment. It's just the pain of the move. <laughs> so, yeah, like I noticed there's like kind of two different types of people like that I worked with during COVID. There's people who love working from home and, you know, it's it's perfect for them and they have everything set up. And then for a few different reasons, you know, a lot of people prefer to be maybe in the office or you know, maybe they don't have enough space at home or, or they just don't have the headspace, you know, with their kids banging on the door or their dogs and cats, you know. Yeah. So. But I felt after COVID, I think we all became very indoctrinated to that working from, you know, I almost had to force myself to get back out again because mm -hmm. um, it like it, it's, yeah, like I have a young baby, as you know, and um, a busy schedule. So it, in theory, it suits me a lot better to work from home the whole time because it saves me a half an hour here and a half an hour there on commuting. But then when you make yourself go out to events and meet people in person, you're so much more stimulated and the quality of interaction you have is so much better. And I think we had forgotten that by the time COVID finished. And, you know, we were very used to just being on Zoom and... um. Yeah having a very closed little world around you sort of you know so I, I found the past year especially once things have properly opened up again and you know you're going out to to events and meeting lots of people it's um very stimulating I think yeah definitely and a lot of us to do a personalities as well because i know i'm more naturally introverted like when i when i was a child and teenager i was like the most introverted person like you'd ever meet like just really shy and like like not comfortable speaking with people and, and all those things and like now uh, like I don't mind but I still kind of just suits better like working from home but I still like love like going to classes you know like for uh I've been doing like jujitsu for the last seven months or going to like kickboxing or something like that so I think it's about you know figuring out what's yeah but I, like even with your friends, I think in your social circle, I've, I I nearly have to retrain myself to go back out to meet my friend. You know, that it was like, oh, yeah, we can go out for a drink again or we can go to the cinema again or something that it doesn't just have to be, oh, I'll ring them once a month. And that's the extent of it. And it's so much nicer. Like if you're catching up with a friend you haven't seen in a while, it's like just, yeah, how much better is it to sit down and have a glass of wine with them or something in person and talk to them face to face than to be doing that through WhatsApp or through a phone call. Oh, for sure. Yeah, way better. And uh, yeah, it's weird. Like with COVID, there's like there's like life before it and then there's like life after it. And like I always have like a memory of I went to uh, uh, Kiev in Ukraine and I got back on like the, the 27th, I think, of February. And then I was supposed to move to Berlin and I had most of it organized. And then I think it was like 16th of March. The world just like shut down yeah and can you remember like a specific moment like before COVID or like during like where you were at the time oh yeah we were um on a ski holiday and it was we came back to to the lockdown announcement I mean we were joking we were sort of in this bubble for a week because we were skiing in the French Alps and um 
we were joking when we went out that we better not be the ones to bring COVID into Ireland. There hadn't been a single case in Ireland yet. And then maybe the first day or two that we were in France, we heard on the news that um, there had been a case in Ireland. And then it started getting much more serious. And there was, you know, Leo Faradkar did that big State of the Nation address and stuff. But we were still in our bubble over in Teen in, um, in the ski resort that we were in. Uh, and it was only when we got home and we it, like it suddenly it, it sort of yeah it, it got scary because by the time we were getting home at the end of that like and that's how quickly things changed this was in a matter of days it went from the start of the ski holiday everything was normal um you know the little ski resort was bustling all the bars were full by the end of that week like five days later people were really cautious everything was empty and closing early it felt like you were sort of getting the last bus out of um, town or something you know when we got to Geneva yeah. airport to fly home and there was this real panic like can you get on flights um so when we got back to Dublin it was very surreal because we had missed the week of transition from normality to lockdown um yeah. and probably had, had missed how how serious it was so yeah that's something I'll definitely remember yeah. And you mentioned, um, you know, that you're, you know, you loved history when you're in school and history is like my favorite subject and it still is. So like, has there been any, you know, books that you've read over the years that have been kind of like, you know, made a big impact on you or, you know, like what have been some of your favorite books that you've read? Yeah, um, I love um, sort of 20th century Irish history. So that like the period around the Civil War and the War of Independence, the 1916 Rising, like that whole um, era has always really appealed to me. Um, so one book that I really liked is called Vivid Faces by a historian called Roy Foster, who I think is British, but has worked in, I'm not sure actually, he's, he's worked in Trinity, I know. Um, he did a really interesting study of the different personalities who were in Ireland in the early 1900s, sort of for the decade leading up to the 1916 rising. Um, and he looked at how we were on the cusp of becoming this much more um, egalitarian and sort of um, uh, liberal state um, that the people who were involved in, in 1916, you know, there was feminists, um, people who come out of the suffragette movement, there was lots of socialists and people who were really involved in the international trade union and labour movement. Um, there were like poets and artists and um, people who were very in influenced by global trends and were sort of bringing this new um, dimension to Irish life that was sort of throwing off the conservatism of the past or whatever. And then because of what happened in 1916 and the way the response was handled after the leader's executions. It, it sort of served the public good. Well, this is his his thesis, I suppose, that it sort of served the public good for a more conservative element to take hold. So, you know, it, it's well known that um, the labour movement sort of took a step back in subsequent elections to let the, the, the more popular parties you know, shine through and that that was really important for the time and to get over the, the civil war and all of that. But it meant a lot of that more liberal outlook got quashed very quickly and like got completely annihilated <laughs> then when the constitution was formed in the 1930s and stuff. So I think that's really interesting. It's like a parallel universe of like a different country that we could have become if some things had been different. So I like books like that. Um, and yeah, like in general, um, I, I mean, I had I had a really good history teacher in school who um, she used to give us a list. She was really well read herself. And she used to every time you were studying something, she'd be like, oh, you must read these 10 books about this subject. So I can remember studying about the Russian Civil War and um, sort of the 20th century history of Russia. And she'd give us a whole lot of books to read about that. And you'd be really interested in that. I've read lots about World War Two. Um, and yeah, I'd probably go back to Irish history more, but like I like I like the international history ones as well. I read a really good book in the last couple of weeks, actually, for it's our book club choice for the book club I'm in at the moment. Um, and it was about the first uh the first British expedition to conquer Mount Everest. Um and uh like 30 years before anybody actually reached the summit. So it was these like British army guys going off full of ridiculous amounts of confidence to say they were going to climb the tallest mountain in the world and you know they had like 
the clothes they were wearing <laughs> stuff you're just reading it going like what were they thinking but uh that's really interesting i like books like that as well mm -hmm. wow amazing yeah there's a quote that i heard before you know it's like if you don't understand the mistakes that were made in the past you're always doomed to repeat them or something like that and it's one of the quotes i've always stuck with, with me for the importance of you know learning history and everything that's happened especially oh, yeah you know 100 years because i think like i think history i can remember being really mad with my little sister who's only she was two years behind me in school because when it came to choosing your leaving certain subjects she dropped history and i was so angry with her like i definitely think it should be a compulsory subject because i, I don't think you can understand contemporary politics and be properly informed about you know the parties that you vote for and their like without knowing their history you don't really know who you're voting for so i think yeah i'd be very very in favor of making it obligatory yeah definitely because it's very easy just to look at where things are at now and then accept them for what they are but if you go back to the roots and then see how they've evolved over time and yeah things have changed and things have changed societally and you know in all different aspects then gives you just empowers you to really make a decision that that you know is more authentic or feels right for you definitely yeah for sure um so you know i i was wondering as well like um you know i have worked with a lot of people kind of similar to you you know where they maybe run their own business or they've got a lot of things or juggling a lot of things at once but like how do you like what are the practical things that you do to like manage stress or when you have weeks when you're like super busy and you've got like you know five or ten different things going on like like what are those things that you do to kind of just stay on a even keel hmm. <laughs> i'm a big believer in to-do lists both in work and in my personal life so i'll probably always have a list on the go of things um you know that i need to do sort of around the house or to prepare for an upcoming holiday or whatever and then like whatever that I need to do for work as well um and I find that's important when you're busy actually because my memory is definitely impacted the busier I am you know um so I need to have things written down or I will forget to do them um and that can make you stressed I think if you're waking up in the middle of the night going oh what was that thing that I forgot you know yeah. um I let's see what else do I do I mean since I've started working with you and since I had my son as a year and a half old I've definitely improved about going to bed early <laughs> I um I used to be much more of a nighttime person and that's just not feasible now um so I do try to get a good night's sleep um and I've always yeah I've always really valued my sleep even even at a time in my life where I was having a lot of late nights I'd um I'd give myself a big lie in at the weekends or whatever you know mm -hmm. um and then I think I think exercise is really important. It's not something that I have built in enough of a routine about consistently throughout my life. So I am trying to change that the whole time as well. Um, but obviously you always feel much better, even if it's only getting out for a 15 minute walk or something. Um, and I think when you're if you have a busy working life, I think finding ways that you can build like that 15 minute walk into your working, you know, like walk to a meeting instead of getting the bus or whatever um, that or I bought a new bike last year and started cycling to all my meetings again, you know, just doing something that um, it gets you to where you're going, but is also good for you as you're doing it. Uh, yeah. And then I think um, socializing and like, you know, whether it's your partner or friends or whatever but talking to people outside of your work um can really help with stress as well even if you're not talking about work you might be talking about something stupid you're watching on tv or whatever but um mm -hmm. I found sometimes during the busiest work times of my life you'd come home and your head is sort of so melted that you don't even really want to talk to the people around you you know but I think it's important to to let it go and then have some conversations you know and just be sociable um and that that sort of takes you out of the the, the stressful situation that you might be in mm -hmm. yeah so that can be the downside as well of being hyper focused on things work-wise is that you know you end up you're so in that environment 
that then you know that zaps all your energy basically away and like it really starts to impact other parts of your life and yeah it can yeah like you could definitely become very rotty with the people around you because because of something that's going on in your work which is really unfair but it's also really natural <laughs> like it's very hard to prevent that sometimes you know yeah oh uh, definitely and yeah i think like the simplest thing you know if that works well for most people is just building things into your your daily life because i mean things are difficult enough as it is if you're working full time um or if you have kids or you know whatever it is and then like i think uh you know some people don't give enough credit to how much of a difference it can make like just making a small change of like you know cycling to work and back or walking to work and back or if you have a meeting like go out for a walk while you're having the meeting instead of you know sitting on the computer or you know all those like habits really compound over you know months and, and years yeah definitely um so uh you mentioned as well like you did some like mental health focus campaigns during covid um i don't know if you're able to like speak about them publicly or not but yeah no there's one well there's one i can definitely tell you about because like it was we ended up winning an award for it actually so it was quite in the public domain but um there is a client of ours that's called the family resource centers national forum so there's 120 odd family resource centers around the country um usually located in communities where um there is a fairly high need for family supports, you know, and that these centres provide everything from like childcare facilities, um, maybe after school clubs for kids, uh, counselling services, addiction treatment services, um, therapies. They're sort of tailored to the needs of each local community. So um, they uh, like the, the exact services might vary from area to area, to area but the idea is that they're, they're supporting people of all ages in their local community. And they were one of the first clients that we did a really big COVID-19 campaign with because um, very quickly at the beginning of the pandemic, they realized what an uh, upsurge there was in, um, what a surge in demand there was for their services. And they started needing to do things like provide food banks for um, you know kids who were normally getting food at school suddenly were going hungry because they weren't going to school because schools weren't open um so they were doing things like that they noticed the huge mental health impact that um covid was having on people particularly older people in rural areas um but also the sort of working parents who were trying to navigate the new work from home landscape and also maybe had three kids who needed to be homeschooled um i, I don't know how parents got through that like geez that's <laughs> just the absolute hell of that and you know sometimes living in a house that you have no space to do work in so you're all huddled around your kitchen table trying to do homework and school work and and work work all at the same time um so yeah they they worked with us um to highlight to government all of these extra demands that were being placed on their services and we ran a survey for them um where we surveyed their staff in all of the local family resource centers um asking them to sort of identify what the different pressures and trends were that they were seeing um mm -hmm. and that got really good media and political attention and it was really interesting to do really stark like some of the you know some of the things we give out about during covid it was just oh our freedoms are a bit curtailed and it's a bit crap that i can't go out to meet my friends or whatever and then you're listening to stories like that where um yeah just people were so isolated like some of the older people in rural communities where like their only lifeline might have been going to their active retirement group once a week or having meals on wheels come to them you know that, that was the only social interaction they ever had with other people and then that's taken away like the impact that that has on a person's well-being um or as i said the kids who aren't getting fed because they're not going to school anymore or who aren't being you know children who are growing up in homes where maybe their parents are are experiencing addiction or have other problems or whatever they school is their safety net and when that was taken away people really really suffered so um yeah i think most of us got through covid relatively unscathed when you hear stories like that you know it puts it into perspective yeah it really does you know when you hear things like that you realize like just how grateful you know we we could we could be every day just to wake up and be like i can have a hot shower this morning i can you know i have food in the fridge i have the opportunity to go and do a workout if i want yeah <laughs> you know yeah. things that we kind of take for granted 
um yeah there's uh there's a guy that i follow on linkedin and i find him very inspiring um jack kavanagh is his name and he's always posting videos of his um and i think he uh he was in an accident basically a few years ago but he lost um you know the use of his legs so he's rebuilding the strength up and like he posts a lot of videos of his process of you know getting back to walking and things like that and you know it's very easy when you're fully able-bodied just to be like not to realize just how lucky we are yeah yeah no, there's so many things we take for granted yeah like a lot of days where I'm not in the mood to like go to the gym or to go do a workout or whatever I'm just like I should and I am going to go do it because you know I I, I can do it you know so why would yeah um but yeah like it's you know amazing that you're able to work on like especially mental health campaigns because you know for so many years it's it's the main thing that's gone unspoken and it's like I don't know if there's still some stigma attached I mean there there probably is but like I've been working on my mental health for like five years now and working you know with a couple of different counselors and I have a few clients that I work with who are practicing therapists and stuff like that so maybe I'm you know I don't see it as much I, de I think there's less stigma amongst younger generations definitely because I think um thankfully um we're able to talk about our mental health a lot more now than than people in Ireland were in the past um and I'd notice it with my own like most of my team are younger than me you know so they're like predominantly in their 20s and 30s and um they'd be relatively open you know they'd like in their line management meetings and stuff like that they'd sort of they'll tell you if if they're struggling or if they're feeling overwhelmed um within reason <laughs> uh so I think that's good because I think in the past the big problem was people just didn't speak about it and even if you hear like my parents generation talking about people they know who've had mental health challenges it's all these euphemisms you know that oh she suffers from her nerves or she's a bit yeah. this or a bit that or you know um he had to go away for a while and they, they never really called it out openly so um mm. I think yeah I think it has changed but like I've been really lucky with my mental health touch wood throughout my life so I can't speak from sort of personal experience. I'm sure there is still some stigma. I, I think sometimes the stigma can be self-inflicted a bit as well. I think, you know, people can feel it's very hard to talk openly about it or to go and ask somebody for help. But yeah. um, I find like, yeah, all of the the people on my team have been so supportive of each other and of, of colleagues, you know, who've had any difficulties. And I would hope that that's the prevailing sort of sense across Ireland now. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Yeah, definitely. There's, uh, I've noticed quite a big difference. Um, because I've worked with a majority of women in the last four or five years, but I have worked with a lot of men as well. And I've noticed that women in general are a lot more open to the idea of speaking about their mental health, but men are. <laughs> it's like a completely different <laughs> story, you know. Uh, think... Yeah, and I, 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 I don't. I think that's always been the case. I mean, women just speak about their emotions much better in general, you know. Whereas men, um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Like my husband goes out with his best friend for a drink most weeks, and they just speak by technology. The two of them are really into tech, and they just speak by tech the whole time, you know. So, um, yeah. uh, it's it's harder. But I think I'm trying to think some of the. When I'm talking about younger men, I am talking about men in their 30s and 20s. But like some of the younger men who have worked with me over the years have definitely not met that stereotype. They are quite open about talking about their mental health. So I, I would hope that's evolving as well, you know. Yeah, definitely. That's why I try and like be as open about it as possible, because I know like anything that I've struggled with, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of other yeah. people similar who are maybe, you know, in the exact same position. And I think there's still a lot of shame, like, uh, attached to even the idea of, like, asking somebody for help or, you know, just to even to even admit that, like, yeah, I feel like really lonely and that's impacting me or I feel. But there's a big culture in Ireland, like historically in general, about so many different conditions. It's not just mental health. It's like addiction issues or um, like fertility problems or even, you know, people having sort of cancer or like just health issues in general where it's very, oh, this just goes on behind closed doors and we won't tell anybody about it. And as soon as one person speaks out, you know, and says this happened to me, 
there's a ripple effect of loads of people, you know, whatever the issue might be, um, mm -hmm. that lots of people will come up and be like, oh, actually, that happened to me as well. So I think our tendency uh, for too long was to be like, oh, that's a private family affair, you know, and, and we don't discuss it publicly. Whereas once somebody lifts the lid on that and starts discussing it publicly, you realize there's so many people who are, ha you know, who are going through something similar to you or who've had similar experiences. And it really helps for people to tap mm -hmm. into that support then. Yeah, definitely. Like the throw it under the rug and ignore it. <laughs> that was the policy. Doesn't work. No. <laughs> definitely not. Um, and yeah, it's you know, it's great that there's so many supports out there now as well, especially for you know, people who struggle with addiction or things like that, because like there's so many different types of addictions as well, not not just, you know, hard drugs, but like so many things. And alcohol is probably one of the the biggest addictions that most people struggle with but because it's more socially acceptable it's not like thought of maybe as much of an addiction but it really is yeah and i mean like ireland has a um has probably too ambivalent an attitude to alcohol as well but um i think i think that's probably changing as well like i definitely find people who are a generation younger than me are much more health conscious than I was when I was in my 20s or than any of my network was when I was in my 20s where you know so many people smoked when I was younger um and um like binge drinking was just what you did every weekend or you know so I, I think that has gotten a lot better and exercise and wellness and yeah these sorts of mental health conversations even like they just weren't as as um common or as popular as they are now so i think there are steps um for the better happening all the time yeah definitely it is like i mean you've seen it more than me because like i i literally finished secondary school in 2012 so i'm I'm still very young yeah uh, but like you've probably seen like a massive shift in culture over the last you know 15 or, or 20 years yeah, like I think one of the most interesting things I've I've lived through though, and it's it's something I'm glad wasn't really prevalent when I was younger, is um the advent of social media because that just what you know when when I was in secondary school nobody had a mobile phone. I got my first mobile phone when I went to college, um and it was a total novelty and they were those crappy phones that like one of the, you could do the massive ones. Uh, radio. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well I actually had a small enough one. You either got a Nokia if you were with Bank of Ireland, you got them free when you opened your bank account. So my friends with Bank of Ireland had Nokias and then I had like a little Siemens thing, um and like you could ring people and send a text message and that was it. And the text messages were you know, um, very limited. So uh it was it's funny. I can't remember what I was looking at recently, and I was thinking. Thank God there's no picture of us when we were in college and in school and the stuff we used to get up. But there's none. Like, there's just no, you know, I have old hard copy albums. But for the four years I was in university, there I don't know if I have any hard copy photos of it. And there's no, like, real visual record of that. And I don't care. <laughs> but now it feels like your life is so lived in public. And I think that has obviously as we all know um has impacts on people's self-esteem and their mental health and everything as well um and i think it's i think it's much harder um in loads of ways to be a teenager with that level of scrutiny um i was reading a really interesting article last week actually uh, it was in the guardian about a woman who had forbidden her, her daughter had come to her when she was 14 and said she wanted to join snapchat and her mother had forbidden, had researched it and sort of went on it herself for a few days to see what she thought of it. And then went back to the daughter and said, no, I'm, I'm refusing your request. These are all the reasons why. But we'll keep the conversation open. Yada, yada. She handled it like very sort of, you know, it wasn't just a straightforward. Absolutely not. Because I'm your mother. Um, And the daughter is now 21 and she wrote a response saying it was the best thing that ever happened to her because she wasn't mature enough at the as you can see now she definitely wasn't mature enough at the time at the time she was really annoyed of course and felt like she was missing out but um that she could see the sort of stresses it put on her peers you know to be constantly online and checking who liked what or who responded to what and all of that and that she was able to live sort of away, away from that and I think that is I think that's really horrible environment for young people who are you know you're you're at such a vulnerable stage of your life anyway without having that extra pressure on you and it's like bullying has always been there and stuff but it just makes it so much easier 
and meaner or something. So I'm glad to have missed all of that. Yeah, no, definitely. Like, like detoxing from uh, social media, something I think about on a daily basis, because I don't know about you, but I always find Instagram is probably the worst one for me. Like if I spend like more than 20 or 30 minutes, I always default back into like comparison, comparing myself to other people or, you know, the someone with their Lamborghini or whatever, you know, and it's like, I end up, um, I just, if I, I'm on uh, Instagram specifically, I'll post something, but then I'll just delete the app straight away. And then I don't even have like any social media apps on my phone other than uh, just WhatsApp or Gmail, but nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I mean, what I get annoyed about is just the waste of time. I'm, I'm like you with Instagram. So I like, I would scroll it for, you just fall into that trap. It's like, I'm tired and I want to go to bed. And then I'm like, oh, I'll just look at it for a few minutes and an hour passes and you're going hot. And at the same time, you're saying I'm too busy to do this. I didn't get time to do my exercise today. I didn't, you know, do the grocery shopping, whatever it might be on your list to have done. And so I get really annoyed with myself then for, say or it might even be there was a program on tv that i wanted to watch but instead i'm sitting there scrolling on my phone for an hour so yeah like it's uh i i just view it as a bit of a waste of time and a bit of a necessary evil because of working the job that i work in i have to be on social media you know not i have to be on it but i have to be aware of social media i suppose and understand how it operates and everything but um mm -hmm. i do feel increasingly i think that the like social media platforms in general have brought more bad than good into the world you know yeah for sure because they're like so addictive i found tiktok was the absolute worst like the the designers of tiktok have done such an amazing job that they make it nearly impossible to get off it so i don't even use tiktok i don't post mm -hmm. anymore don't do anything with it at all because I know it's just like a black hole <laughs> to get started. yeah but I mean and it is it's all done very deliberately you know so yeah it's kind of amazing like uh when I started learning more about um neurotransmitters you know like dopamine and serotonin and how our brains work and stuff like that a few years ago you realize with social media they're designed so that you get a quick dopamine hit from you know you see someone like something or or whatever and then you're waiting for the next time that that happens and it really like programs you almost subconsciously then to want. Yeah. To, which and is... I'm, I'm, I'm getting increasingly sort of impatient and angry with social media companies as well, because, you know, when like any of these big international hearings or cases where they're just pleading like this ignorance that like, Oh, you know, it's not our fault that like teenagers are suicidal after spending hours on our platform. Like we don't, you know, it's just, it's what people put up. Like it's such bullshit, <laughs> excuse my language, but um, like they're, as you say, their platforms are designed in a very sophisticated and deliberate way, you know, and then they see like, they, they seem to think it's fine for them to just stand back and say, well, we've no responsibility for this. And of course they could better regulate how their platforms work and what users are exposed to and what they're not exposed to, but they just haven't, they haven't bothered doing that themselves and governments have been really lax in not forcing them to do that. Um, and I think that should change. Definitely. That potentially could be a, a massive project for you and the team. Oh God, <laughs> that might be more ambitious now that we can take on. I'll support it from a distance though. <laughs> Um, just to, to finish up, I was wondering, you know, like what are some of your, your goals or aspirations going forward? Like, so obviously you've had this amazing journey over the last like nine or 10 years and you've, you know, done a lot of amazing things, but what would you love to see happen in like next 10 years or 20 years or any like big but goals? I'm really bad at planning my life that far ahead. Um, um, <sighs> I mean, we we always say that our, our external purpose as a company is to create change that makes the world a better place. And then we have a simultaneous internal purpose, which is to ensure that our employees um, can lead sort of happy and healthy lives while also feeling fulfilled and rewarded by their jobs. So I want to keep going on making sure we're fulfilling both of those. You know, I'd love us... Um, I think we are a good place to work at the moment and I really want to make sure that we stay like that um you know that we're really competitive on salaries that we're offering all of our employees really good terms and conditions that people don't feel unnecessarily stressed by work ever you know that it's it's a place that people really enjoy working in 
um, and that we stay doing um, really interesting work with our clients. I'd probably like to do some more um, international campaigning work. I'd love to get involved a bit more. We, we have a partnership with an agency called Camilio Bloom that's based in Italy. Um, and they work across Europe and we've collaborated with them on various different projects. Um, and yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to sort of build out that side of work a bit more. Um, and then there's things like these aren't for clients. They're sort of Alice pet projects or whatever we did. Um, we did a project just in January called the Alice Academy for activists, where we brought together 21, um, activists from different areas um, from all across Ireland, North and South, and all age groups from the youngest was 19 up to mid 50s was the oldest, um, and working on issues like hygiene, poverty, um, addiction, integration and anti-racism initiatives. Uh, what else did we have? Sustainability, uh, loads of different topics covered, but we brought them together for four days to um, do a whole series of workshops with them on communications and campaigning skills. And that was amazing. Like that was really energizing and inspiring. Um, and I'd love us to sort of have the, um, freedom really missing the right word, but sort of have the like ability to do that every year or at least every few years, you know, that we're, um, we're upskilling a whole new set of activists to do good things in Ireland but that um, we're also getting lots out of that ourselves like it, it was just really um, a, a fascinating few days spending time with their company so uh, yeah that's that's it I don't want to get much bigger like we're sort of happy with the company roughly as it is and um, uh, I'd like my own time freed up a bit more <laughs> that would be nice if I was working maybe um, shorter days and shorter weeks in the next 10 years that'd be good good stuff nice yeah that's amazing especially that you're empowering like a whole new generation of people that are going to make a lot of changes so yeah, yeah. it's really cool um i'm sure we could probably talk for hours um you know but obviously you've you've got a lot to do today so i'll let you go and you know i really appreciate your time it was it was great to chat and um for anyone you know who's listens to this or, or maybe watching on youtube like um where, you know, if they wanted to find out more about you, where should they reach out to or, you know, where's the best place to go? Yeah, well, our website is, is alicepr.com and all our social media are linked from that. Um, or they can contact me personally on LinkedIn, um, Martina Quinn, uh, or I'm on Twitter and Instagram as well. So <laughs> I'm easy to find. Nice. Good stuff. Well, it was amazing to chat. Really appreciate your time. Um, I'm going to post this. Uh, it'll be everywhere. So YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and a few other places as well. Um, if you're listening or watching this and you have a question or a comment, just pop it down below. And yeah, um, I'll see you very soon, Martina. Great. Thanks, Elan. Thanks,